It's odd when you get to the point in cannabis growing where you realize that the best support you can give to a plant is simply to create the best soil possible and not to feed the plant at all. Being brought up the way we have to try and force feed the plant nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus, the idea that it is our job to feed the soil and then the soil feeds the plant breaks nearly all of the traditional rules around growing cannabis during prohibition. The last 60 years of growing cannabis has been susceptible to the same pressures as regular food agriculture. The idea that dumping chemicals on our food would produce more, healthier food was a bust. And now, according to the UN, a future of thousands and thousands of smaller food farms growing organically is arising as the new best standard. The same goes for cannabis. As cannabis cultivation moves out of the basement and into greenhouses, the more we coax natural systems instead of trying to replace them, the more success we are having producing healthy cannabis with great terpene profiles and exceptional yields. In the end, the more we can truly emulate the earth in our cultivation systems, the more success we will have. If you want to learn more about cannabis health, business, and technique efficiently and with good cheer, I encourage you to subscribe to our newsletter. We'll send you new podcast episodes as they come out, delivered right to your inbox, along with commentary on a couple of the most important news items of the week and videos too. Don't rely on social media to let you know when a new episode is published. Sign up for the updates to make sure you don't miss an episode. Also, we give away very cool prizes to folks who are signed up to receive the newsletter. There's nothing else you need to do to win except receive that newsletter. So go to shapingfire.com to sign up for the newsletter and be entered into this month's and all future newsletter prize drawings. You are listening to Shaping Fire, and I'm your host, Shango Lose. Today, my guest is geologist and living soil expert, Leighton Morrison. Leighton has been a lifelong enthusiast of both aquaponics and living soil. His obsession with Biosphere 2 led him to set up an aquaculture system at the Rodeo Institute. Leighton worked with world-renowned soil biologist Dr. Elaine Ingham, blending his aquaculture byproducts with traditional compost and worm castings to prove that natural inputs could effectively replace synthetics in cultivation. Leighton currently is founder of Kingdom Aquaponics and invented their line of living compost and compost tea products. Leighton is a sought-after public speaker and co-founder of the series of Traveling Science of Organic Regenerative Cannabis Cultivation Conferences. Today, we're going to talk about building your soil to match the Earth's systems. Welcome to the show, Leighton. Hey, it's great to be here, Shango. Awesome, brother. So let's get right into it. You know, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on the show is because when I heard you speak at the Regenerative Conference in Michigan uh, last fall, um, you know, you have got a, a view of soil unlike anybody else that I have met teaching about soil because, you know, you have a lot to say about how we build our pots for cannabis and how, you know, we work with the soil in our yards for growing. But you've got this like like long geologist's view of soil and how it came to being. And I think that those of us who are all really getting into living soil in the rhizosphere um, would enjoy that perspective. And so, so let's start there. Um, the soil that we use to grow cannabis has been around for thousands of years and it's moved around earth in different ways, but we all kind of take it for granted. So, so would you tell us the story of soil and where the hell it came from? <laughs> That'd be my pleasure, my friend. It's it's pretty deep. So um, in a situation like this, I would start by saying, all right, well, let's let's go back to how the planet was formed. And let's look back in time and say, you know, this this planet was a ball of dust and rock that basically was floating in space with no atmosphere. There was no life here. And slowly but surely it cooled down. Uh, a moon was formed. There's different theories about that. But then it formed gravity uh, and it slowed its spinning. And so it began uh, to allow day and night. And that was probably the most important step. Um, and it began to form an axis. So you had cooler spots and warmer spots. That was another big piece of it. So now we've got this spinning globe floating around in space around the sun. Sun's providing heat and cooling when the sun's not out. So then we have an atmosphere that begins to happen and moisture begins to form. 
um, and therefore weather. And bottom line is that weather is what created the soil. Now, the life and how it got here, that's a little bit deeper. But we're just going <laughs> to stick with the soil. Yeah, we don't, that was its own, own show. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, all soil is formed through erosion and then transportation. So by erosion, let's let's start with ice. Ice is a great one because it is unstoppable. Um, it'll push through mountains. Um, it will create streams, rivers, ravines. Um, and then you take the sun. The sun creates heat. Well, if you look at rock on mountains, you'll often see that there's all these pebbles and boulders at the bottom of the mountain. That's because of that heating and cooling. So every time that rock heats or cools, there forms a little fissure in it, and then the water gets in that little fissure and freezes and pops off that chunk, times that by a billion or a trillion. Yeah. And now you're starting to wrap your head around the fact that that rock can actually pulverize itself down to a small enough particular that it begins to build soil. So um, I think the I think the most important part for people to understand is that during that erosion process, you're having many different particulate sizes. This is where I disagree with soil science. Soil science classifies sand, silt, and clay because of their particulate size, not of their content. And to me, that makes no sense. If I put clay in water, it has a completely different specific gravity and reaction in that water than if I throw sand in there. Sand, when we do what's called a textual test, which is basically taking soil, throwing it in a jar, adding some water, leaving a little air, and shaking the hell out of it, and then set it down and walk away. And 36 hours, you come back, and it, you'll have perfect layers of what's in there. The organic matter will be floating on the top. The bottom layer will be sand. The second layer will be silt. And the last layer will be clay. So if you do this and you look at it, you'll be like, wow, that's really dirty water. But when you're done, two days later, the water's clear and everything's separated out. So there's an obvious specific gravity difference. There's an obvious chemical makeup difference or, or molecular bond difference to these things. So, so why is soil science not saying, well, that's clay because it holds a magnetic charge. It has uh, some nutritional properties to it where the sand doesn't carry any properties. I mean, if you take clay, you get it wet, you squeeze it in a ball in your hand, it stays there. If you get sand wet and you squeeze it into a ball, it doesn't stay there. It just, you know, it'll fall apart again, depending on what, how pure that is sand. So they all have these different properties to them, but we're classifying them all based on particulate size. So we got a lot of work left to do, my friend, as far as that's concerned. So let me ask you this. So I love this image of the the earth being this big rock with all of these jagged edges that are mountains and that, you know, moisture forms because of the heating and cooling and it gets in between these crevices and over, you know, epochs, you know, it breaks down these mountains into smaller and smaller pieces that become what we're calling soil, but, but, you know, the, the, what soil is made of the, you know, the, the silt and the clay and the sand, these different bits, did all of these originally start as mountains? Why didn't the mountain break down into all of the same thing? Great question, brother. Great question. All right. So <clears throat> a glacier pushes through a mountain and what comes out of the bottom of the glacier mixed with the water is clay clay platelets, tiny, tiny little platelets. And if you've ever studied and looked at these, they stack up. And when they, they look like little flying saucers, little disks. And when they're magnetically charged and they stack up, what happens is you get one flat one and then one standing on an edge. And then another flat one lands on top of that and another one stands up on his edge. That's good soil structure. Now in compaction, those all lay flat on top of each other. Is that a good enough visual? Yeah, I'm following that. All right, so there's a, there's an electric charge involved with clay platelets. There's no electrical charge in silt, and there's no electrical charge in sand. Sand is can be quartz, it can be pure mineral, um, it can also be calcium from from past coral reefs, which is 
pretty common with sand. And silt, silt is just organic matter broken all the way down. That's why silt comes from rivers and from streams. I so, see. So, so, so even though the process is the same, the breaking down process of, of having moisture, having it get frozen and then broken down, even that is the process, but we get these different uh, ingredients to soil because of what the, the mountain or the coral reef or the, the river is, is made of. So it's the same process of breaking, uh, making small particles, but, but they all come from different part of, of the earth that was originally cold and just spinning. Um, you missed one piece and it, right. was a big, it was a big piece. It's called biology. Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, that. It's a rabbit hole, dude. I'm sorry, but life, all right? So we had a rock, but how do we end up here? All right, life had to come here. Biology had to land here, had to start growing something. And plants and animals came from that. The plants, as they broke down, became the silt. Oh. So, so clay and sand, sand that is not coral-based – came from the mountain but the silt and the organic matter and the life form created the coral and the silt so it's complicated my friend that's interesting Uh, too though because that means that as more and more life spawned on earth the soil content got richer uh, and richer and it became uh, kind of like a geometric increase of ability to carry life uh, bam spot on my friend right on cool spot on all right, so so we get to this point. So you know, clearly, as as life forms were evolving, and you know, we went through these different glacial periods um, over like huge, huge amounts of time. About how long ago did we get to the Earth and the soil structure as we you know generally see it today? How long ago was that? Um, I think the the first or the theory behind the first life on this planet that began that process of breaking down uh, or, or using um, these ingredients to create biomass or more life was when the hydra came onto the planet. And now we had two individual cells that had to communicate, and this gets into endocannabinoid systems. So that's another deep rabbit hole. But bottom line, it was probably somewhere around two and a half million years ago, maybe three, depending on who the scientist is you're talking to. Um, But that's what started the whole process. So we first had a single cell organism, then we had a multi-cell organism. Now we had things in the water. Um, I believe the first living thing on the surface of the earth, as far as plants are concerned, was mushrooms, which is really, really interesting because fungal kingdoms are a whole nother world. And so then those mushrooms, which grow very quickly, as most people know, and fruit pretty quickly, started building that organic matter first. And then all of a sudden, plants started showing up. And it wasn't trees, it was plants. Um, We'd probably call them weeds. But they were the very beginning foundation to when this planet became forested then there's another really badass event that happened and we don't know how it happened but grass showed up on the planet and that was you know that was hundreds of millions of years after trees had had pretty much taken over the planet and that grass shows up in the savannas in africa and the grass choked out trees i mean you still see it to some degree today these meadows these rogue meadows on mountains if you're hiking and so there's all kinds of debate and and like well where'd the grass come from and did it come from space did it come on a comet like like life did you know or was did god just go hey you guys need this or did an alien stop by and seed a friggin seed an area you know Mm -hmm. we don't know but Moving through succession, <clears throat> all of a sudden now we have grass and trees, and that's when the real diversity uh, began as far as life is concerned on the planet. Um, as a matter of fact, the apes now had to move from one patch of trees to another as they ran out of food. That kind of forced them to walk on hind legs so that they could see over the grass and make sure there was a predator that was going to jump out and eat them. So it, that, that, that combination right there was what I would consider when – 
earth became more like the Garden of Eden that that it was until man got crazy in the Industrial Revolution and really started to mess things up. Oh, well, that's a beautiful transition because that's where I'm going next as well. So so now that we've got an idea of how, you know, nature formed, you know, a thumbnail of it anyway, with a lot of potential rabbit holes to go down. But <laughs> but so then like humans and agriculture show up. Right. And so and so I'm curious that, you know, did did soil begin to especially change faster after human agriculture showed up or is our impact relatively small compared to glaciers? and such moving it around all right well let's let's talk about natural disaster Mm. let's talk about earthquakes and volcanoes you know one of the reasons the redwoods are where they are is because of volcanic ash is is so fertile i mean you everybody's heard of azomite i assume Um, it's a wonderful product and i want to bend your mind a little bit more and say the reason that those redwoods are concentrated on the pacific was because the volcanoes were there and the wind was blowing from east to west, not west to east. So that kind of located them on that part. Now, if the, if the, if the ash had been blowing east, you would have much more redwood and diversity going toward the east than you do now. You really don't. I mean, it's weird. You get those high mountain kind of plateaus where there's a lot of grasslands but you lose the trees as you drive from Washington from west to east. And this is true pretty much, you know, everywhere. Uh, Same thing happens in SoCal. You know, as you go west, you get into desert, uh, more arid, less fertile climates. So then you now add in the fact of continental drift, all right? So we were once just one big giant continent that broke apart and created these different multi-climated areas. So... You know, there, there's, there's a lot more to starting to understand how those soils really form because I think it's like 80% of all soils on this planet were formed through transpiration. Transportation, in other words, the air picked up some dust and blew it. Um, one of my favorite stories that I love to talk about is in 2011, NASA did a study that basically concluded that all of the sandstorms in the Sahara Desert were throwing so much dust into the atmosphere and it was traveling way, way up. And then it was blowing across the ocean and then somehow coming back down to provide phosphorus for the Amazon rainforest. Some believe that it was particularly charged but when it hit the, I forget what the atmosphere where Tesla wanted to store all the electricity. Um, but basically we have an outer atmosphere where that's very magnetic and very electrically charged. Some believe that those particles got that high and all of a sudden they started attaching to each other until they formed small molecules, which now through gravity were forced to drop to the surface of the earth. Others say, well, no, it's the moisture and the clouds, but you know, it's, it's deeper than that. Um, so, and just recently, uh, a new guy grabbed that and ran with it and, and come to find out that it wasn't just phosphorus. It was fertilizer. And that fertilizer came from diatoms. And I love to talk about diatoms. Diatoms produce, I think it's close to 60% of all of the oxygen on this planet. It's not coming from the rainforest. The oxygen that's growing down in the Amazon rainforest is being used up down there in Brazil. It's not, it's not getting up here. The reason we're breathing, the reason we have oxygen up here is because of diatoms and the plants because obviously the plants pull in CO2 and they excrete oxygen. But the other part of that piece that no one talks about is these little creatures called diatoms. We don't even know what a diatom is. A diatom, you know, people wanted to throw it into the bacterial kingdom, but it has a chloroplast in it, which is a tiny little solar array that takes light and creates energy and allows it to multiply, et cetera, et cetera, and live. And others want to throw it in a plant kingdom because, hey, it's got chloroplast. Well, it doesn't fit into either one. And this is, again, where my bitch in science is, is that we're trying to land on Mars, but we don't even understand what the hell's going on here. Let's get this figured out, all right? Jesus, Leonardo da Vinci said it back in 1745. We know more about the movement of the celestial bodies overhead than we know about what's underfoot. All right, we, or why haven't we started to focus on this? I mean, we need water to drink. We, we haven't even gotten into the water cycle and how critical soil is for the water cycle. 
um, this is this is one of those things where I've always tell people, you know, if you're really interested in this stuff, buy the DVD Symphony for Symphony of the Soil. Um, it's 15 bucks. It's an hour and 20 minutes of your life, and it will pop your cork. And in part of that video, they have an experiment that was performed down at Rodale where they had four bottles that they filled soil with. Um, the one on the left, I believe, was a pure synthetic um, farming system. And the one to the far right, I believe, was a pure organic soil system. So then he takes, I don't know, 100 milliliters of water or something like that, and he dumps in, into these bottles containing the soil. And the first thing you notice is on the synthetic one, the water comes out all muddy, high in turbidity, dark and cloudy. And there's a lot of it. The vast majority of that water moved right through that soil into the bottom of the jug. And on the far right one, which is a pure organic soil, the water that came out was crystal clear, number one. And number two, there was only a little bit of it. So that soil held the water. So it also cleaned the water and made it suitable for drinking. And so what if what is the effect of all of the disturbing of soil that we're doing right now and then adding in synthetics uh, is it recharging the groundwater no it's destroying it and worse yet we're pumping out of an aquifer that took millions of years to form <clears throat> and we're sucking out so much water i think tucson arizona dropped by 60 feet the midwest has dropped by 40 feet once you drop and crush an aquifer it's done <laughs> it's not coming back for another million, two million years until it, the whole process starts over again. So we're not cleaning our water through our soil. We're draining it out of an aquifer that we cannot fix. As a matter of fact, a good friend of mine, Dr. Kevin Fitzsimmons, who works at the U of A, uh, University of Arizona, um, was called in to deal with the fact that the aquifer was collapsing down in Tucson. And they were piping in water from uh, North Cal or South Southern California uh, in these giant canals, and they were the canals were getting clogged, and they needed to put fish in there to try to chew up all this plant matter that's growing in the canals because they're running water through a desert. And so he was there to advise on how to get this organic matter cleaned up out of the river. He's introduced, um, I believe, they were grass carp. But as being a part of this whole system, he was exposed to this water cycle, and he found out that the water company had decided to pump that water that was coming from, I think it's the Colorado River, one of them, uh, pump it down into the aquifer to prevent the aquifer from collapsing. Good idea, right? Yeah, sounds like it. Let's lay a placeholder. All right, just to hold it. Well, you know what it did? It remineralized. Now they introduced different pH, different minerals, and all of the infrastructure, all the pipes that are buried underground are now rotting and sending up chunks of metals and minerals in the water. You pour a glass of water down in Tucson, Arizona, and it's black. It's all filled with particles. You can't drink it. They destroyed the aquifer by trying to fix it. This, this is what man does. He just makes a mess out of everything. So, so back to soils and how critical it is for life and how we're ignoring it and, and just pissing all over it and not thinking ahead about like, hey, wait a minute, what are we leaving behind? The good news is, hey, this planet was a, was a radioactive waste uh, a million years ago or uh, excuse me, a few billion years ago. And also, no matter what we do to it, there's already been six extinctions. There'll be another one and it'll come back just fine. But in the meantime, if we want to move forward as a, as a species and not just wipe ourselves out, we better start thinking about soil, water, and food. Um, and that all starts from the soil. Right on. So, so, so let's jump ahead a little bit because I, I could listen to you talk about this particular part for hours, but we don't have time for all of that today. So let's bring it back towards um, the, the specific point of growing cannabis in these soils. So let's jump ahead to agriculture, right? And so to what kind of an impact did agriculture have on the quality of the soils in the United States versus how it was prior uh, to agriculture? And, and give us the smaller version of this epic tale. All right. Um, the Dust Bowl. Real simple. Uh, the people ask me, where is the most fertile soils on the planet? And I say, well, what do you think? And they say, oh, the rainforest. Look, look at how, look how 
big it is and how much it grows. And I say, no, actually it's not. The most fertile soil on the planet <clears throat> is actually a meadow, is the prairies. Uh, the organic matter that's allowed to build up is is insane. It could be 20, 30 feet deep of just rich organic matter that's formed in layers. So a dust storm blows a little dust, and then so you get a layer of dust. And then uh, there's a, a heavy torrential downpour, and this area washes out, creates mud, and that, that puts another layer over it. Um, and then the plant's growing and dying, growing and dying, growing and dying. So you have all of the nutrients you possibly can imagine. And so a man gets in there and plows open a section and goes, woohoo, look at how, look at the corn I grew, look at the carrots I grew, look at the potatoes I grew, look how amazing this is. And they keep growing in that same spot and pretty soon they notice, well, the plants aren't as big. The, the, the fruit isn't as good. It's, it's, not, it's not yielding as much. So they go plow open a new section of the prairie. So what agriculture does is strip the nutrients and actually begin to cave in the soil, create compaction. And then plants won't grow there anymore. And we did it so hard, so bad that we created the dust bowls. And we're going to do it again real soon. So how do you fix that? How, how, what is the proper form of agriculture? Polyculture. Dragonfly Earth Medicine. I love those guys to death. What they're doing is showing people how to continuously, year after year, produce amazing results from the same piece of land. And I love Sir Edward. Oh, what was his name? Uh, he was a guy from England. Um, he talks about um, early uh, soil respect and how you need to leave 50% 50 50 behind. So if you're going to grow corn, figure you take 50% of that, the rest of that corn you chop and drop. Wow. And that's the minerals and nutrients for next year's season. And if you don't do that, if you just keep taking and taking and taking, you've stripped all the nutrition nutrients out of the soil and left a dust bowl behind. And that's essentially at the heart of, I mean, we talk about regenerative agriculture and especially about regenerative cannabis agriculture on this show a lot. And like where you have brought us up to, this is the heart of the whole game right here. Bam. Yeah. Spot on, brother. So, so before we go to um, our first commercial, there's one more thing I want to talk about, and it's a little bit of a non sequitur, but, um, you know, I, uh, I want to talk about peat moss. So, you know, there, there are a lot of folks who teach organic cannabis growing who, who for some reason think that, that we can use peat moss and they recommend it. And I've always believed that, you know, I've got bogs where I live here on Vashon Island and, and they're very, very sensitive. And so it's always been my belief that we should not be using any peat moss because they come from bogs that have taken thousands of years to build and it's not a um it's not a regenerating resource and so so what is the, what's the real biologist's take on peat moss like is, is there is there an excuse to use this throughout cannabis like we are or is should, do we need to like grow up and realize that this is not a resource we should be using Oh, we should not be fooling around with peat moss. It's a triple negative, Shango. First of all, the peat bogs are a water cleansing source. Second of all, they're a carbon sink and a really, really big carbon sink. And third of all, they're an ecosystem in their own self. So you've destroyed an ecosystem, you've destroyed a water cycle system, and you've released a ton of carbon into the atmosphere. And we can't replace it in our lifetimes. So it's no, like, they, yeah. no, the, the bogs in, in England have all been shut down. They've stopped all of it. They're not removing any more peat. And everybody across the surface of the earth should do the same thing. Now, interestingly enough, I met a gentleman, um, Mont Hadley, uh, years ago uh, down at Rodale or at, through Rodale somehow. And he was creating this product called Pit Moss, which I loved. And it was basically shredded newspaper. Um, as a vehicle for explosive root growth for the cannabis industry, for every every kind of you know potting, you know the flower industry, uh, starter plant industry, you know he wanted to start reusing you know a closed loop, use newspapers and cardboard, grind it up, and make this substrate that would be ideal for growing cannabis. Well, unfortunately, he got shark tanked. 
Uh, he got all kinds of investors and they've taken it in other directions to the point where now they're actually making bedding for horses uh, and other animals, which is great. Again, it's a closed loop. You're reusing systems. That's awesome. Um, and I did some studies with them early on um, with plant growth down at the um, Phipps uh, Conservatory down in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And they were trying to figure out how to be more regenerative in the greenhouse setting because they have these beautiful displays. I mean, they got trees and bushes from all over the world in this botanical garden. And they wanted to be more sustainable, and but they needed to grow these container plants fast because every three months they change over the whole system. So <clears throat> they were looking for fast production. They were looking for an alternative to peat moss. They wanted to get into soil biology. Well, when I introduced this, my soil biology into their pit moss, my soil biology basically did the same thing when you introduce more than 20% biochar. The bacteria in the biology just said, hey, I don't need nothing here. I'm all set. I'm just going to live on this newspaper. I'm not going to work for you, Mr. Plant. I got everything I need right here. And the same thing happens with biochar. The biology goes right to that biochar and just sets up camp, and it's not interested in the root. It's not interested in hanging out in the rhyosphere and helping the plant. It's got everything it needs. So there's there's a delicate balance to <clears throat> finding a solution to peat moss. Uh, I loved coconut core. I looked at that for a while. And then I started to see how unregenerative the, the, the techniques were and, and the cross-contamination, the salts, uh, packaging, shipping it all over the world. Eesh, that's not regenerative. That's That's no good. So... I think people have to start building their own solution to peat moss and absolutely stop buying it. If you stop buying it now, you'll slow down the destruction. You will not stop the destruction because they'll keep making this stuff and stacking it up as high as they can, figuring that sooner or later someone's going to come and buy it. So to stop that is going to take years. So if we don't stop now, we're screwed. And you've heard me. I, I say this repeatedly. I'm praying to God that we make such an impact in the regenerative cannabis world that the rest of ag across the planet starts going, wait a minute. Why are we using synthetics only to have to use pesticides? Why aren't we looking at plant health and regenerative focus toward not destroying the planet, but, but enhancing it, making it better for the next generation? Chopping and dropping fifty percent so that I don't destroy the soil. You know these kinds of practices. But oh, please stop using peat moss. You're, you're you're just you're triple killing the planet by using that stuff. Right on, man. Thank you for making it very painfully clear. So so let's go ahead and take our first short break and be right back. You are listening to Shaping Fire, and my guest today is soil biologist Leighton Morrison. Living soil and regenerative cannabis agriculture are surging in popularity, and to implement these biological solutions, real science education is vital. If you are interested in all things probiotic growing, you will probably want to attend this year's Science of Organic Regenerative Cannabis Cultivation Conference. For the third year in a row, co-founders Joshua Rutherford of Dutch Blooms and Leighton Morrison of Kingdom Aquaponics have lined up an incredible array of educators with all new content for the traveling event. They're calling it version 2.0, going deeper down the rabbit hole. This year's teaching staff includes Elaine Ingham on soil biology, Chris Trump and Wendy Kornberg talking Korean natural farming, Kevin Jodry on cannabis genetics, Kelly and Josh from Dragonfly Earth Medicine, Suzanne Wainwright, the bug lady, Chip Osborne on soil chemistry, and many other thought leaders rotating in and out for different cities. So consult the website to know who specifically is coming for each location. There will be a breeding panel, a Q&A panel with the entire teaching staff, and on Saturday night, there will be a bubble hash discussion as well. Joshua has built in significant informal time for you with the teachers. The teaching staff is just as excited to work with you as you are about attending. There is also no advertising during the event. The only vendor booths are for cannabis seed breeders. Your tuition is what's paying the staff, so they will all be present and attentive to you, not a corporate sponsor. Even better, the conference is not just for folks on the West Coast. Humboldt, California is hosting one event for sure, but the show is going on the road to Vancouver, British Columbia, Portland, Maine, and Whitmore Lake, Michigan. Get out your pen now because I'm about to give you the website. This is a fabulous opportunity for you to hear from an array of nationally recognized top shelf soil educators all in one place. 
Not only that, this isn't just beginner stuff like you get at most conventions. This is an intensive for people like us who totally nerd out on the rhizosphere and growing in living soil. And if you attended last year, be assured that this year is not simply a repeat of last year. Every speaker will present different material than they did last year. The website is regenerativeorganiccannabis.com. That's regenerativeorganiccannabis.com. This year, tickets will be limited in number to preserve the intimate experience and will only be sold in advance online. There will be no ticket sales at the door. So don't wait and miss out on your chance to attend this important gathering of the regenerative cannabis community. Cut through all the misinformation out there and don't miss this opportunity to learn real soil science. RegenerativeOrganicCannabis.com As a business owner, you are incredibly busy. In reality, you are responsible for everything your company does. You've got so many responsibilities every single day that often you just don't have the time to really dig into your marketing as deeply as you'd like. You know there's more that you could do to reach out to new customers and encourage loyalty in the customers you already have, but you certainly don't have the time for it, and you're not ready to hire somebody full-time for that role either. For you, I recommend Blunt Branding. At Blunt Branding, Kirsten Nelson and her team are focused on improving your bottom line. You know, most marketing firms are excited to make your logo, packaging, and website very pretty, but they leave responsibility for improving your bottom line up to you. They don't want that kind of responsibility, but that's pretty much the most important part of marketing, right? Kirsten and her team will help you engage new customers, funnel them to your point of sale, whether it be online or a storefront, and keep them coming back to you and telling their friends. Now, if you happen to be a new cannabis company or an established company moving from medical to adult use in your state, Kirsten especially can help you. Not only is she well-versed in marketing and finance, but she totally gets cannabis, whole plant medicine, terpenes, heritage farmers, and the particular needs of startups. Check out what she did recently for Moontime Medicinals and Humboldt at MoontimeMedicinals.com. Kirsten and her team put together a whole brand package for them, built their website, and wrote their sales materials. No doubt this is a paid commercial spot, but that does not mean they bought my opinion. I've worked with Blunt Branding on five projects now for various of their clients, and every single time they have done more than they have promised and over-delivered on results. I love how they generate new revenue and focus on that as the goal instead of just making a pretty logo. Similarly, every single friend I have referred them to has come back to thank me, and that just does not happen every day. Grab a pen and paper because the website address is coming up. If you want someone to implement marketing programs that feed your bottom line, give Blunt Branding a call. They will share proven techniques to increase your audience and generate sales while using cutting-edge technology solutions in the background that make all of this easy, automatic, and trackable. Go to shapingfire.com forward slash Blunt Branding to find out more. You can also click the link in our newsletter. Blunt Branding, marketing that makes you money. Welcome back. You are listening to Shaping Fire. I'm your host, Shango Los, and our guest this week is soil biologist Leighton Morrison. So during the first set, we went, we covered a lot of area and traveled through many years. And during second set, we're going to bring it on home to how you can use this knowledge uh, to uh, grow better cannabis. So Leighton, let's start at the top. You know, most everybody is using uh, containers still for cannabis, and we're going to talk about the soil in the ground. But but let's start because you know you approach soil structure in in containers different than anybody else I've come across because most everybody has got like their soil recipe, right? You put out a big ass tarp, you put down your start your whatever your base soil is gonna be, you throw your amendments in it, you 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 mix it up, you put it in the pot, shazam, off you go, right? And then like with you know over over longer term, hopefully you're not throwing away that soil every year and you're reusing it and and that can become no till, right? But your approach is different. You're always talking about building layers in the containers. So I hand you the floor and I would like you to to teach us why you find that to be more effective and appropriate. Cool. Thank you. Um, I biomimic natural systems. So the way I look at anything is like, all right, well, how did nature do it? Nature did it by layers, and they're called soil horizons. And we were fortunate enough to have uh, a time um, to do a quick video where you're going to put it up on YouTube, and people will be able to go look at it. And and we're going to talk specifically a little, well, 
touch base on the horizons and why they're so important. So diving right in, um, I tell cannabis people, um, you know, you guys have been doing this and yeah, it works, but it's unsustainable because you basically, if you're using salt or organic newts, you're burning the soil up. You're adding too much of some stuff because each phenotype or chemotype pulls different things out of the soil. So you strip this and now you try to grow the same plant. Well, it's not going to do well in that soil. And the only way to figure this out, it gets really deep. It has to be biological, chemistry, phenotype, chemotype, understanding the cultivar and your soil, your environment. Uh, you know, the sun is much hotter out here in northern Washington than it is out east. It's totally different. So back to the horizon. So I would say to these canvas guys, I'm like, yeah, you, you know, you build these new packs, you build these, you know, what I want to call organic matter um, level, uh, organic matter, O horizon. That's what you're doing. You're just building the O horizon for your plant. And it does work. I mean, proof is in the pudding. It's been around for quite a while, and this technique has been around for quite a while. Problem is it's unsustainable, and you have to dump it. Maybe you get two years out of it. So I was like, no, 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 let's let's copy nature. And so I'm recently working on a project in Colorado, a good-sized grow, indoor. Um, and he contacts me, or I got brought in because of the other consultants involved. And they asked me, all right, well, how, how are we going to build the soil? And I was like, well, it's the same way nature does. And explained the horizons to them and I said you know by the way what is what is your budget for soil and I think it was like a quarter of a million dollars and I'm like okay well you know what I'm going to save you about two hundred thousand dollars <laughs> by doing it this way all right and I got his attention pretty damn quick so I said all right we're going to first of all we're going to build an alluvial horizon and that is basically just rocks and a little bit of sand and that only has to be a couple inches thick and it's right at the very bottom then we're going to build an A horizon, and an A horizon is going to have sand, silt, and clay, and some organic matter. And I can get into the percentages, but they vary depending on what you have locally. Because I don't source material in the East Coast and have it shipped to the West. I go to wherever you are, and I find what your local sources are. Not all clay is created equal. There are clays that have absolutely zero nutritional value and are dead. They do not have a magnetic charge cation exchange capacity that's what fuels that is that electrical charge that magnetism so <clears throat> i source these local ingredients and i blend the sand silt and clay and organic matter to a certain percentage and now that is your a horizon then the top is your o horizon now we're back into your guys's mixes where you're using rice hulls you're using peat moss which please don't use anymore um, compost and other organic matter uh, materials and so basically what happens is that what happens is when you water that organic matter the a horizon below it will actually wick out excess moisture so that that soil just never gets anaerobic that o horizon that organic matter and if anyone's ever played with a tremendous amount of compost you can see how much moisture that stuff will hold you can grab a handful of it and squeeze it and literally get the water to come out of it, out of your hand. So you're, to have pure organic matter is a real problem because you're going to have anaerobic pockets that you can't control. And worse yet, um, jumping into the biology side of it, what happens to bacteria when they are on an or, uh, a very moist environment is as that moisture wicks out, the bacteria does something called cyst. So basically what a cyst is, is when a bacteria forms a wax coating around the outside of itself and it pulls the moisture and the food it needs inside that sphere. Consider it a bubble. And I can get into the physics uh, behind the bubble and why that, how it forms, but that's too complicated. So when the bacteria forms this wax coating around its outside, and that's happening exponentially around the outside of that organic matter as it dries out, you just created a vapor barrier. You just created a way for that water to not penetrate back into the organic matter. It'll just run off. That's called hydrophobic. 
So now you have anaerobic pockets and now you have hydrophobic soil, which is locked up. You, you can't, you can't access it. Plant can't access. It. And you've, you've, you've melted your roots in the anaerobic zone. So now you've made your plant unhealthy and you've eliminated the plant from being able to use the, the, the organic matter on the sides and potentially on the top. So when people are building pots, what I tell them is like, you really need a vapor barrier around the sides of that pot so that there's no way that it can go hydrophobic. That moisture level inside that pot is staying at that moisture level that you're controlling. Number one. Number two, if you're using an O-horizon, which you have to, you need to mulch the top of it, either with a living mulch or some kind of hay or some kind of bark, something that won't allow the air to wick that moisture out, to steal that humidity that you're trying to keep in there for the plant and for the rhyosphere and for all the biology. But you have to have a way for that water excess to drain out of it, and that's the A horizon. So what happens is the A horizon prevents fines, we call them fines, little tiny particulates of sand, silt, and clay from getting down in there and creating what we would call a compaction zone. So a compaction zone is where mo moisture and water cannot move through that soil. So it gets trapped at that zone and the roots come down, they hit that zone and bam, oh man, it's anaerobic. It melts my root tips. Now I'm going to get an infection. Now I'm going to have a problem. So that's why it's so important that you allow moisture to move all the way through these pots. So the alluvial layer at the bottom will take up any excess moisture. The A horizon will wick the excess moisture out of the top. So as you can see, they all work together to create this magic called moisture, water cycles, moving through gravity. Does that... Does that answer the question? Yeah, actually, I've just been sitting here with my eyes closed, just listening to you and picturing these different layers and it all fits together like this beautiful melody. But I do have questions. So my first one to clarify, when you're talking about building these layers in the pots, I believe you described three layers, correct? You've got a sand and stone layer on the bottom, and then you've got a, a silt layer in the middle, and then on the top, you've got what we would normally be our soil mix. Is, is, am I close? Is that is so, or, am I, or am I still far off? No, no, you're, you're kind of close, but the A horizon is not silt. It's sand, silt, and clay. Sand, so, silt, clay. Got it. Sil sand, silt, and clay and organic matter. There's definitely some organic matter in there too. And it's just a percentage. Like I think it was 17% clay, 13% silt, 50% sand, and that leaves, I think, 20%, and that would have been the organic matter. So, you know, of, of all the recipes that I've experimented with and, and such to build up my knowledge base, I've never gone out and bought clay or silt. Like, what actually do I go to either A, in a perfect world, wildcraft? What do I go out and wildcraft? Or, more realistically for most people, what do I go to the nursery or horticulture store and buy? I mean, I, I mean I've never heard of a bag of silt. Does that exist? <laughs> no. No, it doesn't exist. Um, you wildcraft it. And, and basically what you do is you go to um, one of my favorite places to go shopping is um, – the golf course industry mm. um, because they are building high performance soils they bring in stuff from all over the place and they generally will know like hey I'm, I'm building a golf course in this area so they'll they'll contact all the local uh, sand pits quarries um, and they'll they'll talk to the local contractors to find some of these sources so that then they can locally harvest the material blend it together and build their high performance sports fields. You know, so. I never really thought about it that way. Um, everything that you're describing is all absolutely necessary information for golf courses um, because that's essentially what they're selling you. They're, they're selling you like perfect ground. And mm -hmm. so if they're going to make perfect ground, they got to make sure that they are not making you know, wetlands or something. And so, and so, and they wouldn't want to ship this stuff in from all over the country because it's super expensive. So they're going to be, uh, finding it locally. Huh? That's mm -hmm. very interesting. Yeah. So, so, so there are actual like companies that serve the golf courses in different regions and that would be where we'd want to look. Right. And, and to be honest with you, you have extremely fertile soil out here. 
Remember the volcanoes? Yeah. That's clay. Uh, clay is made through two per two ways. One volcanic ash. The other is uh, a glacier pushing through and grinding rock against rock. So, so you can find clay locally. Either sometimes I'll reach out to a pottery company, uh, especially if they're like a regenerative potter, pottery company. They'll say, "Oh yeah, we have we have different local sources of clay here. Um, sometimes we blend it. Sometimes we don't. Sometimes we just use it, you know, naturally." Um, so there's a there's a good resource for clay, but all you really got to do is dig a hole. You, you've got clay in there. Hmm. Um, everybody does out here. So uh, that was that would be how I would source my clay. And then the second way to source, or the other way to source your silt, is again understanding how silt was made. Silt is just organic matter ground up to the finest possible mo- uh, molecule, which is kind of like a humate. So it, Silt is bigger than a humate, but but it would soon become humate. It sounds like you're talking about like forest duff. Uh, no, forest duff is different. That's O horizon. Mm-hmm. Silt silt would come from a riverbed, uh, the bottom of a lake. Um, if you if you have uh, say a pool that that's defunct and filled with uh, algae and and all kinds of leaves that are that are rotting on the bottom of it, that's silt. That's organic matter digesting itself and, and turning into humates, but it's first silt. <clears throat> so I always go to water sources to find my silt, like creeks um, or old areas, old washouts. Um, you know, one of my favorite places is, and, and this is, this is the beauty of God or the universe, Gaia, whatever you believe in, but where the rivers meet the ocean. Uh, estuaries. Oh my God. It's all silt. And I always tell people, if you're going to wildcraft, you better wildcraft respectfully or you're going to get zammed. You're going to get with zapped by Gaia. She's going to bitch slap you. <laughs> so you better bring in – if you're going to go in and get a couple five-gallon buckets of this stuff, you damn well better bring in a couple five-gallon compound buckets of, of uh, compost or an offering of some kind. Um, if you don't, you're going to end up harvesting some bad stuff and you're going to have problems. Um, one of the things that you have to understand about wildcrafting silt is it is anaerobic. Like if you ever walk down the side of a river and stepped into the mud and sunk up to your knee yeah. and then you pull your foot out and it smells like hell. So that silt has to be blended with a tremendous amount of more dry organic matter or dry uh, – uh, clay so that that can wick the moisture out of it and begin to make it aerobic. Um, one of, one of the things that I do in my job, um, I harvest, uh, fish manure from, from different, um, fisheries and, uh, aquaculture and aquaponics, um, systems. And the first thing I have to do is aerobically stabilize it. So I kill off the shigilla, I kill off all the spireum, spirillum. And the only way to do that is through increased dissolved oxygen in the water column. So I have to build up the oxygen in that water as, as fast and as hard as I possibly can to kill all that stuff off. Every batch is different and I have to use a microscope to determine that I've got that DO. I mean, I can use a DO meter, but it doesn't mean that I've gotten rid of everything yet. That DO meter is just telling me that I'm in my ballpark, but now I have to watch and wait till that till that conversion happens. So it goes from anaerobic to aerobic. And there's a gray area in the middle too. Um, and I, I could really dive deep on that, that in itself, but I'm not. I'm going to stay focused here. So, <laughs> so the silt has to get – has to become aerobic as quick as possible or you're going to have some issues. So if you're wildcrafting silt, understand that there – you you have to be – Use your common sense and be really responsible about this. Um, I have found some sources of silt through um, excavators. They say, "Oh yeah, I was digging, I was digging over here, and I found this layer of black shit that I, I don't understand what it is." I'm like, "Oh, where is it? Show me." And you go over there, and now that layer has had the moisture wicked out from the A horizon underneath of it, so it's been aerobically stabilized through gravity and time. Uh, Gaia's work. Um, so there are ways to do it, but the easiest, quickest source is usually going to be creeks, rivers, streams, old lake beds, swamps. You know, that's where you're going to get your silt. 
when you're talking about the the bottom layer, um, I think you called it the alluvial layer, and that's where the rocks are. What size of rocks are you talking about? Are we talking about rocks the size of the palm of your hand that are pretty big, or are you talking about more like pebbles? Um, I like to use all of them, um, so everything. Now, if you're limited like the gentleman in, in Colorado, my alluvial layer is only four inches, so I could not use something the size of your palm. So what I told him was we we sourced out um, a local uh, quarry that that grinds rocks up and makes gravels and stuff like that, and <clears throat> we sourced out a material called inch and a half minus. So what that is is that's going to be rocks that are the biggest rock you'll get is inch and a half, but it's going to be minus all the way down to sand. Hmm. So basically, that's the way an alluvial layer works. I mean, like you go to the beach, you go out to Vashon Island, you go out to the beach, you see all the big rocks on the top. But if you dig down, you're going to start to see smaller and smaller and smaller rocks and, and sand and, and a little bit of clay and other things. So again, biomimicking nature. I told him, all right, just let's use the inch and a half minus because that'll be easy to work with. What's going to happen is you're going to you're going to layer this stuff in and then you're going to just wa- briefly water it down. And you're going to notice the sand goes right to the bottom and the rocks kind of come up to the top. And, and that's now – part of your filtration system so it's going to it's going to allow the water to pull into those pockets in between all of the rocks and the sand is going to help to wick it out of the top and of course you've got to leave your beds leave a little cracked space at the bottom of your bed so any excess water will come out and you're gonna have to use a little filter fabric or something um, to prevent the sand from oozing out if you want it to be really neat and clean and this guy was he he wants to when he walks down his rows, he doesn't want to see any little sand slipping out from underneath his boxes. And his, 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 that was his idea to add the filter fabric. And at first I was like, eh, don't add anything you don't need to. And then I'm like, yeah, I understand. You don't want it to, you want this place to look sterile and nice. You don't want, you know, fine oozing out from underneath the sides of your beds. Yeah. And then eventually he would have to replace that in the pot. And so you might as well just keep it where it is. So, right. All right, so before we go to our second commercial, let's do one nice thumbnail summary. So if I'm hearing you correctly, my first layer that's going to be three or four inches is going to be, you know, inch or two size uh, stone all the way down to very small. So, so you know, two inches all the way down to minus, I think is what the vocabulary word you were, you were using. And then, and then my, my middle layer is going to be uh, sand, silt, and clay. And you've already talked about how we can, we can get those. And then, and then our top layer is going to be whatever our preferred living soil mix that we would normally do. And you build this layer cake in every single pot. Absolutely spot on. The only thing you forgot was the organic matter. Remember in the A horizon, I have 20% organic matter too. Right on. And, and I guess while we're adding that, the, uh, the green mulch too, this is the first year that I, I ran tests using, uh, you know, like little gl- grasses and clovers on the top of my pots. And it's, it's wildly different experience. You know, I've, I've gotten a hydrophobic layer on top of my pots for years and years and years. And, and by mid season, the water is running off the sides of the pots. But this year, um, oh, actually, especially the, the radishes I used that Elaine Ingham uh, recommended, you know, I've got all these little plants and they all create all of these pathways for the water to go down into the substrate of the pot. But it also creates like this mini rainforest. And uh, and and keeps the the top of the the top of the pot uh, moisture or you know moist, and so I never get that closed out. So so that would be your top layer then a green mulch. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I love the living mulches because you guys are all big fans of rhyosphere. You understand how important they are, and those those little micro roots coming out of those little microgreens or living mulches are sending out miles of rhyosphere and those that's where all your nutrient cycling is so that plant is getting those rhyosphere getting those organisms to do its nutrient cycling well, what happens when that root crosses over the root hair of a cannabis there's an exchange that happens yeah they talk they, they, they give each talk, other nutrients and they, yeah, yeah and if this one wants that hey i got some of that i'll trade you for these you know and that's that's the way nature works 
So having that living mulch on the top is critical to preventing hydrophobic, to continue to grow out um, your rhyosphere and, and building soil tilth and structure, um, as well as, as the critical communication that, that happens in nature. And when you guys just grow one plant in there, you've isolated the poor thing. How, how is it supposed to communicate? How is it supposed to become fully – hit its full potential when you've, you've limited it to no, no buddies, no friends, no, no family? So this – again, this is why I love Dragonfly Earth Medicine and the message that they're bringing forward is huge and that is polyculture. Don't isolate a plant. It does it, – that doesn't happen in nature, biomimic nature. And if you do that, the results are insane. They're night and day from what you're used to. Fabulous. So with that, let's go ahead and take our second short break and be right back. You're listening to Shaping Fire, and my guest today is soil biologist Leighton Morrison. Cultivators who grow in living soil are very particular on what inputs they use in their soil. They educate themselves and painstakingly create compost and nutritive teas to create thriving soils that will produce the very best expression of the cannabis plant. Many living soil farmers now believe that, over time, seeds become acclimated to the kind of substrate they are grown in. For example, a seed that was bred in synthetic fertilizers may not immediately know what to do in a living soil environment, slowing their growth and decreasing yield. The Regenerative Seed Cooperative is a different kind of seed bank. The Regenerative Seed Cooperative only provide cannabis seeds that were bred in living soil and using probiotic growing techniques. That way, when you germinate in soil, the seed's genetics will recognize the environment and immediately start interacting with microbes and fungal networks. These seeds are described as bio-intelligent. The number of cannabis breeders participating in the Regenerative Seed Cooperative is rapidly increasing. Already signed on are Bamboos, Stock and Bean, Pacific Northwest Roots, LOS Gardens, Dragonfly Earth Medicine, ITAL Foundation, Bob Hemphill's Cricket and Cicada, Dutch Blooms, Heart Rock Mountain Farms Pride of Lion, Sebring Seeds, and Mount Baker Highway, with more being added every month. These seeds are regulars, autoflowers, and hemp varieties. A significant amount of the profits go to cannabis seed preservation projects available to everyone. Do you want to take every advantage that you can when growing in beautiful, healthy soil? Then consider buying your seeds from the Regenerative Seed Cooperative at regenerativeseeds.com. That's regenerativeseeds.com. Skinny dipping, humpback whales, beatnik poetry, the Ottoman Empire, soil remediation, interdimensional beings, and tree frogs. These are just a few of the interesting topics you can find in the audiobooks library at audible.com. If you like podcasts like Shaping Fire, chances are that you'll dig audiobooks too. Just like with podcasts, audiobooks speak to you, telling you stories and teaching you stuff. Here's the thing. Audible.com has an offer I want to tell you about. Right now, they're offering a trial of their audiobook service for absolutely free. You can go to shapingfire.com forward slash audible and you will get a free audiobook straight up. You can listen to it on your mobile device, computer, or you can download it and listen to it like anywhere. It's really simple. Of course, they want you to subscribe to their service after the free trial and enjoy their audiobooks forever, but you don't have to. All you have to do to get the free audiobook of your choice is to check out the service for free. So that's the deal. Your first book is free, it's easy to sign up, it's easy to quit, and their online library of free books is pretty incredible. Just check it out. Go to shapingfire.com forward slash audible to find out more, or click on the link in this week's newsletter. Welcome back. You're listening to Shaping Fire. I'm your host, Shango Lose, and our guest this week is soil biologist Leighton Morrison. So, Leighton, let's jump right back into it. During the last set, we talked about how to properly use these horizon layers in containers. But a lot of people are growing outside now more than ever because people are allowed to grow their particular number of plants for THC-based cannabis. But also, we've got all these people using these fields now uh, to grow... Uh, medical hemp. So, so let's talk about the same concepts of using the horizons, but let's assume you're going into the soil. Perfect. Um, in any type of situation where I'm in a field growing outdoors, first thing I do is what's called a perk test. So basically I dig a hole and I look at the soil horizons. So I'm learning. And then I pour a five gallon bucket of water in there and I hit the timer. And I watch and I wait to see how long it takes. If that water does not drain out of that soil pretty quickly, you got a problem. What's pretty quickly? 
um, within a f- minute. Okay. Um, if that five gallons doesn't dry, doesn't go dry within a minute, then you have what would be considered a compaction zone. And when I'm doing a perk test, I dig a big hole. I'm not talking like a little, you know, 10 scoops. I'm talking a trench. I want to get down and see those horizons. I want to see how deep my O horizon is, how deep my A horizon is. Then there's typically a B horizon, which we didn't touch on. And sometimes that's an alluvial layer. Sometimes it's B. Then sometimes there's an alluvial layer underneath the B. And sometimes there's bedrock under there. But all these things are important to understand. So I basically tell people, you know, dig dig a hole as deep as you think the roots are going to go. And if this is a 14-foot monster, (laughs) you better believe those roots are going 14 feet in the ground. So you might need a backhoe. You might need an excavator. But you got to go about it methodically like like you were – biomimicking nature. The worst thing in the world you can do is dig a hole, throw in a bunch of organic matter and plant a plant. What's going to happen is if that's going to turn anaerobic, all that, all that O horizon is going to do is suck the moisture out of the soil. And then there's going to be a, the fines are going to migrate and you're going to create a, 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 like a, like a clay kettle for the plant and the plant's not going to do well. Um, So if my soil doesn't drain, and I don't see the right layering that I need, I will go on top of the soil. I build a horizon on top. So that way I know if it's raining and it's pouring and we get this extreme weather, which people, hello, we're going to get extreme weathers. We had lightning in freaking North Pole. We've had lightning out here. We talked about that earlier. So everything is going to be extreme. And by extreme, I mean extreme rain, extreme drought. So if this is extreme rain and your plant is in a, cauldron it's going to fill up and kill it so you've got to make sure that you're looking at drainage and that's a big piece of this whole thing so if your soil doesn't drain you've got to dig another hole a little bit higher until you see that water disappear if the water doesn't disappear and your soil is pure clay based and it doesn't drain then you got to build on top of it so these giant commercial hemp fields if you're talking big ag they've already destroyed the aggregate so bad that it doesn't matter they're just going to puke synthetics on it and then tons of pesticides to, to keep the the pests at bay so that's a different system and, and we i don't even want to go down that rabbit hole i want to stay focused on what your existing soil system is and if your soil does not drain then you have to start terracing and there's a number of different ways to do it i always love you know finding dead wood on the property and and using that as the sides of my um, raised bed because it does two things. It provides fungal food. It provides insulation and protection um, from the sides getting hydrophobic. And again, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's regenerative. It's, you're not, you're not taking or destroying something. You're just using something that was already present, but you're using it, um, in, in a different manner than it was intended, but uh, the log in the in the woods, the, the fall we call them blowdowns, um, that's serving a purpose to the forest, but it can also serve you a purpose um, as long as you're not like harvesting new trees. I would never do that. Um, then why not use these logs to to raise your beds? And if if you're going to try to do commercial ag in this method, forget it. It's 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 not really cost effective. So if your field doesn't drain and you've got water, squishy ground, uh, I'm sorry. You're going to have to find another piece of land if you want to go big. So before you buy anything, you know, you really got to do your homework on this and understand, all right, was there synthetics used there? Because there's residuals. There's there's going to be some issues if there was that was if that was farmed um, commercially and non-regeneratively um, over time. Um, what happens is the fungi will tie up some of it. Some of it will get broken down on bacteria. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about rehabbing soil in the next couple minutes, but, um, you know, the, the goal here is to find a place that's suitable for what you're trying to do and that the soil is functioning in a proper way that it will allow you to do what you're doing. So it sounds to me like when we move outside and we're actually in the ground, the moral of the story is find out whether or not your your soil can um, remove the moisture by doing a perk test. And if you if you um, if you are doing, you know, craft or your home grow 
and your perk test fails, well, you're going to have to build a raise bed. And if you are trying to do, um, you know, you know, agriculture, multiple acres, and it fails the perk test, you just got to move. And then, so, so you figure out that option and then either, and if your, your ground, um, succeeds in the perk test, whether, and in you're at home or if you're doing craft, well, then that's easy. You just dig a hole and then you follow the recipe that you laid out with the horizons that we talked about in the second set. Um, and you know, to be honest with you, all you really need to do in that case is remove the top 12 inches. Cause it typically you want, you want this plant to get biointelligent. You want its roots to go down and out to the sides. You want to give it the, the ability to grow really quickly and bust a move. But at the same time, as soon as it gets to the sides where you, your organic matter isn't there anymore, you want it to start weaving itself into the indigenous uh, plants that are there. So you don't really need to dig a huge hole. You, you do want to see the horizons. You do want to understand what your soil system is. And you do want to perk at a lower level as well as, as a top level. So you're really getting a good feeling of, of what this plant is going to be, what you're exposing this plant to be. Did that answer the question? Yeah, it did. It did. Um, um, I never really realized the importance of the perk test um, before, you know, I mean, I guess that's probably because I've, I've mostly grown in containers, but, uh, my God, I can imagine people listening who have purchased their land to do medical hemp and it's overly wet and they're realizing, oh my God, I didn't do a perk test. And, and now their choices are either a spend several seasons and lots of money rehabbing the land or they've got to move. Wow. That's a, that's a pretty heavy duty thing to miss. Unfortunately, uh, the earth moves in geological time. Yeah. We do not. Yeah. <laughs> and, and investment capital, even less. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. So, so, okay. So, so you've, you've explained to us how that we can, we can, um, redo these, um, horizons in the soil. Um, but before, before we wrap up for the day, I want to make sure we talk about how to rehabilitate, um, uh, you know, maybe we'll talk about rehabbing land a bit, but we all have this experience of having, uh, being at the end of the season and, and our, and our pots are done and, you know, some people will go and they'll, they'll put them on, you know, in one part of the property and they'll stack them, right. And they'll create all this compaction or they'll put them in a barn somewhere and they'll get like ridiculously dry and, and all the microbes will die out. There's not a lot of people who cut the pots and they just leave them all out to nature so they can stay, you know, ferociously alive. So, so why don't you hit a couple of the, 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 the challenges that you see most often uh, that need to be rehabbed and, and give us an idea of how to go about doing that. Okay. Um, you know, I'm not a big fan of pots. <clears throat> I'd rather everybody be in raised beds because you can do what nature does. You can biomimic it. In the fall, it falls. <laughs> All the organic matter falls. And that is an insulation layer. So it's insulating the soil from freezing like a rock. Now, in, in New England, we get four feet of frost. So it's, this isn't going to work. Out here, you don't have that issue. And so what I would say to people is put your pots all together and just bury them in leaves and hay so that you have mm -hmm. that organic matter rotting around your plants, keeping it, mo keeping it warm, keeping it moist, preventing it from freezing. But if it does get frost – that's not the end of the world. The, you know, in New England, our ground freezes four feet deep and the grass comes back in the spring. Now, in the forest, the ground never freezes. And, and they did an interesting study uh, a couple years ago, I read it, about they, they basically kind of cut all the trees down in the middle of the forest. Um, and then they, they measured the biology and the ups and downs in both the area they cut it down and then the area where they didn't touch it. And they found that, that – the area that they didn't touch really never froze. And there was always some biological activity 
um, e even when the snow was piled on it. And as a matter of fact, the snow was another insulator. And, and they went so far in this experiment as to actually plow the snow off the surface so it got exposed to freezing and the wind. And it was radically different. I mean, they lost huge, huge colonies and diversity in the soil because it froze solid and it didn't have any kind of roots. It didn't have any kind of rotten, rotting um, or mulching or, or composting that's happening naturally. So, so I would say take your pots and if you want to leave them where they are because they're too big to move, then you want to build a compost pile around them. Um, and and or, uh, again, you don't want to put a tarp over them. You don't want to let them dry out. You want to let them be exposed to the diversity of the environment because that's going to help the organisms that you need to survive. You, you don't want to spoil them. You, you want to keep them you know, exposed to some of this, but you also have to protect the pots, keep them warm, keep them alive um, so that in spring they're ready to go. But if you let them dry out, now you've created all of those cysts and those cysts are a bitch to get out. I mean, I had some fun back in my early days screwing around with uh, desert inoculants. And people go, oh, that's desert, so everything's dead. Well, you know what? The desert is amazingly fertile. If you see a desert one day and it's dry as a bone and then the monsoon comes in, you come back the next day and it's alive. It's amazing how green it turns in 24 hours. So that works because that soil um, system and the biology are used to these extremes, but yours aren't. Your, your soil systems, like I would take some of this inoculant and I throw it in water and it would literally float for, for days. And, and it looked like sand silt. It looked like, you know, sand and, and clay. So it was coarse and rough and I'd throw it in the vial in the test tube so I could look at the biology in it and this shit would be floating. And I called Elaine one day and I was like, Elaine, what, the, what is up with this? And she goes, you got to give it time late. It'll, it'll eventually sink and then you can look at the biology. But it's, it just blew my mind that, that earth could float on water. But that was the biology. That was the bacteria. And so you know, in your system, your bacteria and your biology are not, not going to do well if they cyst up. It's going to take a long time for them to rehydrate and, and come out of that cyst and start to work for you again. So this is why I'm saying, you know, protect the pots um, with hay and le straw and leaves um, so that they have that buffer, but they're not just completely um, exposed or unexposed to the extremes of nature. It sounds like you're suggesting that really what the, the, the best way to rehab is actually to do preventative because once, once your hydro once your pots have gone cyst and have become hydrophobic, um, you, you might as well break down the pot and start over again. Um, because breaking down the pot and starting over is, is going to be a lot easier and might even, um, you know, make more biological sense as well, instead of trying to undo what has already been locked up. Correct. And, and the other thing is that if you're going to go that way, um, I would highly suggest that you compost that soil. Hmm. Like, like don't just throw it off, spread it around, make a layer of it so that it's being exposed to the moisture underneath. Uh, let, let the grasses grow up through it. Um, let it, let, give it back to nature in a responsible, uh, method because, you know, I know guys that, that, that try to reuse their soil, reuse their soil, but the nutrients have been stripped of it. And if, unless you want to pay, you know, 15, 20, 30 bucks to test each pot to see what was stripped out of it by your cannabis plant, the cannabis is a nutrient pig. I've never met a plant that's, that's like this. It sucks. It's, it's worse than corn. It sucks the nutrients right out of there. And that's why a lot of you guys in the past had made these newt packs to add to your organic matter, um, to make sure the plant had access to all the things it needs. Um, that's not regenerative because now you're buying bags of stuff that are coming from all over the world and somewhere someone machines crushing and stripping this earth and creating scars to harvest this stuff so how do you get around that sand silt and clay and biology and organic matter that's how you prevent 
it from stripping. So in pots, you've stripped it. You, you've stripped out everything you need. So now you're going to have to replace those those minerals, which are expensive to get and expensive to test to find out which ones you need to replace. So, so let's finish up with a little bit of talk about no-till because I, what I think I'm hearing you saying is that um, you're not actually, you don't actually believe that the the, the no-till system um, is regenerative because the plant will use the nutrients that is in the pot. Um, and yet you're not a big fan. I'm get, I mean, think I'm hearing of, of add, you know, adding amendments, top dressing, and then watering them in because you're saying that these, these amendments are often taken from other places, but, but what can we do perhaps to wildcraft locally and top dress so that we can keep these mature systems? Because I love starting the year with a, an already mature mycelium uh, you know, system in the pot, uh, everything seems to thrive more. So, so if, if we were doing no-till and we didn't want to ship in, you know, exotic stuff like seabird guano from islands and stuff, um, like what, how should we think about using no-till, but wild crafting locally? All right. You went down a rabbit hole, my friend. <laughs> You well, got, a, got another hour. Yeah. Right, see, if to, you, see if you could do it I'll in try, five yeah. minutes. All right, all right, I'll try to do this one quick. Um, all right, there's a couple different things going on. First of all, um, that mycelium. All right, first of all, let's start with no-till. In my mind, no-till is soil, is, is fields, not pots. I, I don't know. I, I've struggled really hard with trying to think of a pot as, as no-till, as, as, you know, regenerative. I, I don't know if, if, if you can ever – not amend that at some point in your time and i hear you on the mycelium now the mycelium you're seeing is called saprophytic fungi they're decomposers they're, they're part of a whole the whole soil food web and they have a very very important purpose and function the other side of that is the mycorrhizae and that is a that is a fungi that works directly for the plant it is infected into the plant cells and it's pulling nutrients from outside and bringing them right into the internal side of that plant and if you if you till you lose your mycelium you lose your mycorrhizae every time it takes 90 days to colonize um, mycorrhizae which means it takes 90 days to get it up and running fully functional that's the time you're harvesting your plant yeah. for some of you so how is it that you can get that colonization to occur in that pot and then harvest the plant and and hopefully the mycorrhizae spore out and that they're still there so that next season when you plug in your plant, it's there. But I don't know is that's that's going to be true. And I have yet to see anybody, you know, do some test studies to see whether that mycorrhizae overwintered in that pot without a host of some kind. Um, so that's one interesting piece the, the, the saprophytic will be fine. They, they'll, they'll overwinter without a plant. Um, so I get the whole understanding of like, I like my pot ready to go in spring and I go, that's where I go back to composting. If you build a compost pile on top and around of that pot, then you've maintained all your microorganisms. You know, if you, if, if you can find a, perhaps a small, um, conifer that you could plant in there so that there was some root systems that are still moving, um, that there was something still living in there. Now, unfortunately, when it came time to spring, you'd have to either rip that thing out or cut it so that um, you could grow your cannabis in there. But that's kind of the only way I, I can ever like try to, to think that that would be a regenerative method to growing in pots. And I'm going to continue to bust my head open on this to try to figure out a way that I can tell people, all right, if you do this to your pot, you're going to be okay. You're going to be fine in spring. Um, but I just haven't had the time and, and the money to do the research um, and the testing um, to really prove that or, or come up with a method to doing that. So I'm kind of just shooting from the hip here with, with this and brainstorming with you. But I mean, that's, that's the direction I'd go is find something that I can put in that pot that's living and mulch it like it would be in a, in a forest so that it doesn't, you know, thoroughly freeze. Maybe it freezes for a day or two, but that's okay. It didn't freeze all the way through like a friggin' rock. Um, I, I guess that would be, that would be my suggestion for, for that. 
Right on. Well, uh, thank you for ending the show with a surprise. Uh, you know, I, I kind of thought I knew what the, the no till litany was I was going to get from you. And you went a totally surprising direction, which is one of the reasons I was excited to have you on the show. So, so Leighton Morrison, thank you so much for sharing your vast experience and even more than that, your passion, man, because, you know, there are a couple of times you made the hair on the back of my neck stand up just because I could feel how excited and how, you know, passionate you are about this. And, and it really came through. And so you, you represent a, a very unique perspective and uh, we're all fortunate to have been able to enjoy it. So thanks a lot, brother. Oh, thank you, Shango. It's always a pleasure to talk with you and I'm looking forward to chopping it up some more with you in the future. Fantastic. So if you want to hear more from Leighton Morrison, there's a couple ways you can do that. So the first way you can do that is when uh, Leighton was ex explaining the different horizons, there is a particular image that he uses in his slide presentation that is really helpful in understanding it. And um, he has provided that to me and we recorded a, uh, a video a couple weeks ago at my house and uh, he goes through it in a little more detail while you can look at that slide since this is a podcast and you can't actually see the slide, feel free, feel free to jump over to the Shaping Fire YouTube channel and check that video out. I'm posting it the same day that this episode comes out. Uh, number two, if you want to, uh, you know, follow along um, and, and see what Layton's up to, or if you want to drop him a message, the best way to do that is to go to his Instagram account, which is Kingdom Aquaponics LLC, Kingdom Aquaponics LLC, which is also the name of his business. And you can go along and follow him there. And if you, if something comes up and you want to talk to him or invite him to speak or similar, uh, you can reach him that way. The last way is that, um, you know, we did not talk at all about, uh, Layton's, uh, line of fantastic, uh, products and inputs, um, that are unlike anything else in the business. And if you want to check those out, you can check those out at Kingdom aquaponicsllc.com. You can find more episodes of the Shaping Fire podcast and subscribe to the show at shapingfire.com and on Apple iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play. If you enjoyed the show, we'd really appreciate it if you'd leave a positive review of the podcast wherever you download. Your review will help others find the show so they can enjoy it too. On the Shaping Fire website, you can also subscribe to the weekly newsletter for insights into the latest cannabis news and product reviews. On the Shaping Fire website, you will also find transcripts of today's podcast as well. For information on me and where I will be speaking, you can check out shangolos.com. Does your company want to reach our national audience of cannabis enthusiasts? Email hotspot at shapingfire.com to find out how. Thanks for listening to Shaping Fire. I've been your host, Shango Los. Mm -hmm.